Washington was able to use the power and influence he gained with his accommodationist approach to secretly fight against discrimination with little risk of retaliation, no doubt a practical means of achieving equality. However, he would also use this influence to attack his political opponents and deny them power, hindering the fight for equality more than he furthered it. In his infamous Atlanta Compromise speech, Washington advised blacks to cast down your bucket where you are, telling them to stay in the South and contribute to the post-slavery economy as tradesmen and laborers. He concluded the fight for equality was nothing more than folly and could not be attained via black activism but rather by hard work and perseverance. Washington believed that any success for African Americans required the assistance of Southern whites as they controlled the state governments and owned most of the property. By working side by side and closing the racial divide, blacks would eventually be granted equality by the South. This belief was clearly expressed in the Chicago Daily Tribune. A correspondent reported most whites supported Washington and reckoned his approach would inevitably lead to African Americans gaining equality. Gaining economic power in order to support a demand for political rights has been regarded as a feasible strategy by some historians, but this completely disregarded the prevailing attitudes towards blacks at the time. Could African Americans gain industrial power and advance themselves economically, while simultaneously being disenfranchised and oppressed by Jim Crow? For Du Bois, the answer was an emphatic no. White Southerners would not have granted African Americans any kind of power, be it political or otherwise. White attitudes towards blacks at the time were rooted in racial inferiority and subservience. A well-received novel suggested allowing them to gain industrial power would be an act of suicide for the white race. The field of agriculture was the proper one for the black man. Du Bois asserted that with his policy of cooperation and acceptance of prevailing standards, Washington effectively agreed that the black race was inferior. Though this criticism was harsh, white southerners evidently would not allow blacks to compete with them for employment and would force them into menial jobs such as agriculture. Washington's attempt to placate the white south meant he would disregard the brutal oppression faced by African Americans. Washington claimed conditions for blacks in America were satisfactory, which prompted several angry responses. For Du Bois, Washington had clearly been biased due to his relationships with white benefactors, and ignored the deplorable conditions for African Americans and the 3,500 lynchings in the last 25 years. Washington's accommodationist approach was intended to prevent this violence by not provoking whites. Du Bois and others deplored this tactic as they questioned why black men should kiss the hands that smite them. Washington argued Du Bois did not understand the reality of conditions in the South and could not comprehend the fatal consequences that would occur for political activism. Washington dined with President Roosevelt at the peak of his popularity, and this was met with disgust and hostility from the South. Southern newspapers rebuked the president for suggesting a black man had enough status to dine in the White House, and felt the white race needed to be protected from the evils of blacks. Washington believed Southern whites had a feeling of gratitude towards African Americans after slavery, and therefore would support any reasonable effort to help them. This was evidently incorrect, and maintaining white supremacy was the main priority for the South. As the Richmond Times stated, white Southerners would never accept social equality for blacks, no matter how far they progressed economically. Though Washington's method to gain social equality was unpractical and had no chance of success, it also demonstrated that any black political action would be met with anger. Accommodation was not Washington's true intention, however, and he fought legal battles by proxy. With his secret political action, Washington was able to fight for equality without the threat of violence looming over him. This was where his plan truly became practical. Whilst Washington publicly advocated against political activism, he privately engaged in the very same. Washington funded and supported several successful legal cases, such as the Dan Rogers discrimination case and the Alonzo Bailey case against Peonage. Historians have been conflicted on Washington's political action and his intentions. Norrell argues he doubted any political action could halt the aggressive disenfranchisement of African Americans. Contrastingly, Harlan argues Washington attempted to fight against black oppression in secret, whilst publicly denouncing activism to placate the South. Washington evidently wished for blacks to continue their fight for equal rights, but intended for the whites to think otherwise, as shown by his effort against the Hardwick Disenfranchisement Bill in Georgia, 
Washington has been labelled as a hypocrite by many, but his actions were both practical and far less prone to a violent and brutal response from Southerners. He was able to secure minor victories in the Supreme Court with his approach, but he would ultimately misuse his power for his own personal gain. Washington frequently engaged in espionage against his political opponents, much to the detriment of black activism. He clashed with the Niagara movement which was led by Du Bois. Washington had his white allies pressure nearly half of the original movement's supporters into backing out prior to its first conference. Washington further prevented the movement from receiving any national news coverage with his connections to the Associated Press, meaning it failed to make headlines and gain any meaningful public attention. The fight between Washington and his opponents clearly turned him bitter. He boasted he had evidence incriminating Du Bois as his enemy. Had Washington secretly supported the NAACP's precursor rather than oppose it, it may have seen great success. Upon Washington's death, Du Bois declared he was heavily responsible for the increasing oppression under Jim Crow. Washington did not stand up for African Americans with his personal vendetta, and rather hindered their fight for equality. Washington's actions were effectively part of a public relations campaign to ease tensions between African Americans and white Southerners. But as Norrell concludes, one man could not overcome the deeply rooted white supremacy and racism in the South. Washington's accommodationist stance granted him significant influence in the white South, and he was able to secretly fight against discrimination in many instances. Unfortunately, he would end up using this power to oppress his own people and sabotage the fight for equality. This was not practical for African Americans, and undoubtedly made their struggles for civil rights greater than it needed have been.